Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Fauzia Begum, Medical Lead for the Post-Covid Service. Thank you so much for attending today. It's our pleasure to be able to tell you a bit more about Derbyshire's Post-Covid Service, when to go to your GP should you need to be referred and how that process works, how supporting mental health is embedded throughout our service and the importance of individualised rehabilitation as we take you through a patient's journey. So first of all, a bit of history in the making. The first cases of COVID-19 were confirmed in York in January 2020. We then start hearing the phrase long COVID being used amongst those who contracted COVID-19, but symptoms remained ongoing for months after the initial infection. This was around May time. We had NHS England recognise that there was a growing population group who needed additional um, assessment and support to manage their ongoing symptoms. And in, so in October 2020, set up a network of assessment clinics across the county. Uh, Derbyshire was one of the first um, to be set up, and we saw our first patient in December 2020. Uh, by June 2021, we'd had over 100 appointments within the service, and the rate of referral was starting to increase as more GPs became aware of the service. So NHS England proposed more funding at this point, uh, to expand the care provided to those with long COVID. And it was around this time that the long COVID hubs for the paediatric population were also set up, ours, our closest one being in Leicester. So then in September 2021, uh, Joined Up Care Derbyshire launches an adjunct service to this. This is the long COVID support service for health and social care staff um, and who've had symptoms of COVID-19 going on for more than four weeks. Um, anyone working in primary or secondary care and the social care sector, uh, including local authority services, can refer to this as a self-referral process uh, to get physical rehabilitation and mental health support to help them stay or return to work. Um, so far, 380 staff have been through this service um, and I'll put a link on the, on the chat um, if anyone who is on this call today or knows anybody who might benefit from this part of the service as well. And finally, um, our last big milestone was in April 2022, at which point over 1,500 patients had been referred to the assessment service by GPs. Um, we re we re launched rehabilitation hubs at this point um, across the county for individuals with ongoing therapy needs after they were medically assessed in the assessment service. And Chloe can tell you a bit more about this later. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of service development, so a year after the assessment service was launched, our GPs and advanced clinical practitioners were seeing about 20 initial appointments and 10 follow-up appointments per week. Um, there was tests to assess lung function and heart rate monitoring, amongst other things, in-house, and cases were escalated to a medical or therapy multidisciplinary team meeting, uh, consisting of lots of different specialists from across the county. Um, we prescribed where appropriate. Uh, we then referred patients on for rehabilitation support to pre-existing services across the county or referred them back to their GP for further investigations or for management for things that we picked up but weren't related to long COVID. Um, the service has continued to grow and now our rehabilitation hubs have become more established. Uh, we are seeing more patients than ever. As you can see, we're seeing 35 initial appointments and follow-ups per week. And we're establishing our own diagnostics and imaging pathways. Our psychology support has grown, and now we're uh, uh, sort of able to provide you with occupational therapy, physiotherapy, psychology, rehabilitation support where required in house. Uh, next slide, please. So, in terms of getting a referral to the service, so if you've had COVID 19 and your symptoms continue to cause you difficulty beyond four weeks, we recommend you discuss this with your GP in the first instance. Um, I've put up common symptoms, a little bit small on the slide here, but I've put up some common symptoms. Uh, and based on latest data from the Office of National Statistics, we know that over 1.8 million people are, are currently uh, reporting long COVID symptoms um, across the country. Um, and the more common symptoms are fatigue, that's 54%, uh, shortness of breath in 31%, loss of smell in 23% and muscle ache in 22%. And this has remained the more common symptoms in the, over the last few months. Uh, your GP will take a history, perform some blood tests and investigations to make sure that your symptoms aren't related to a different condition that may be treatable. 
um, and then send this information to us electronically. Next slide, please. So this is a bit of a messy slide. Um, and I really put it up to give you a brief overview of how integrated the whole process is really, um, you know, after your, your referral is picked up by us. So we provide self-help material and links to the national website for long COVID support, which is called Your COVID Recovery, um, while you're on our waiting list. Uh, we'll refer you to the staff service if that's appropriate, again, while you're on our waiting list. Um, and then once your appointment comes, you'll see one of our GPs or advanced clinical practitioners. Um, there may be a need for psychological support, um, MDD discussion or face-to-face -face appointments with one of our physiotherapists uh, before we refer you on to our therapy hubs once we feel you're medically safe for rehabilitation. Um, there's multiple services on hand once you get there to support your ongoing needs. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so one story we'll sort of take you through is that of Kamala's. So she is a 26 year old primary school teacher who took some time off, is now on a phased return to work, who tested positive for COVID-19 in November 21. So a GP referred her to our service um, and following an initial appointment, we picked up the following symptoms you can see there. And then functional impairment from these symptoms were discussed and we did some goal setting and we used this to personalize her journey through the post-COVID service. Next slide, please. So as mentioned previously, we can do lots of different tests uh, run by physiotherapists and other colleagues uh, while you're still within the assessment service part of the service. Um, and this would be depending on clinical need. So things like spirometry and monitoring of oxygen saturation would take place in, in the case of Kamala's story where she's got this ongoing breathlessness going on. Um, these things are all coordinated by amazing clinic coordinators. And as an adjunct through the service, we also have health and social care, health and well-being support workers uh, to support ongoing uh, needs that will support your overall well-being. Um, as Kamala was also tearful and distressed, but she was unclear whether she was ready for mental health support, we discussed the case with one of our clinical psychologists. And on that note, I will pass you on to Dr. King Campbell, my colleague. Thank you, thank you, Fazia. Um, so can I ask for the next slide, please? So, Kamala was struggling with an array of symptoms, including profound fatigue, breathlessness, migraines and brain fog, in addition to anxiety and low mood. And she was very distressed when she came to her initial assessment. She was unclear about what she wanted help with first, and it was unclear to her initial medical assessor as well. So she was referred for a clinical psychology assessment. So a psychology assessment can be thought about very simply as a conversation between two people where we come together to try to understand your distress and find a way forward. And that's what we did together with Kamala. So at her assessment, Kamala described feeling emotionally overwhelmed by the impact of her symptoms. She described feelings of inadequacy, of being unable to perform tasks she used to be able to do very easily and took pride in at both work and at home. She described grief related to the loss of her former self and the roles that she used to perform. She described demoralisation in the face of fluctuating symptoms that never seemed to get better. And she was also experiencing anger at the arbitrariness of the one to become ill with long COVID. And overall, she was struggling with a pervasive sense of anxiety and uncertainty about what the future held. So we used the assessment to begin to map out the relationship between Kamala's physical and emotional distress how this had created a vicious cycle that had led to an amplification of her physical symptoms. And as the conversation unfolded, Kamala began to talk more deeply about her guilt of being unable to work to her old standard or of supporting her family in the way that she would like to. And this had begun to make her feel ashamed of herself as she began to self-criticise. Now, combined with the worry that other people would judge her in the same way, she'd begun to push herself beyond her physical limits. This meant that she couldn't give herself the time she needed to convalesce, and her condition had begun to deteriorate. She'd begun to make more mistakes at work, further eroding her confidence and self-esteem. So, together, we worked on helping her to appreciate that fluctuations in capacity are not the same as an underlying loss of competence. We taught her how to listen to her body so she no longer pushed herself beyond limits. 
And over time, Kamala began to develop a more compassionate relationship to herself. And this in turn helped her to tell others about her difficulties and ask for the reasonable adjustments she needed at work. Now, at the end of a piece of individual psychological work, Kamala then felt able to go on to join the group rehabilitation programme. And my colleague Chloe is going to tell you about that in a moment. But just before I hand over, I just want to take a moment to talk more widely about kind of the work of clinical psychology in the long COVID clinic. Could I ask for the next slide, please? Thank you. So everybody will have their own individual illness experience, but there's a commonality that experiencing profound illness has an impact on our emotion or psychological well-being. And I wanted to share with you a quote from Paul Garner, professor of tropical medicine at Liverpool, who also had his own experience of, of, of COVID. And I felt his words caught beautifully something of the overall experience. So I've been through a roller coaster of ill health, extreme emotions and utter exhaustion. Although I'm not hospitalised, it's been frightening and long. The illness ebbs and flows, but never goes away. So sometimes overwhelming feelings, not always, but sometimes overwhelming feelings and the absence of other support can lead to defined mental health problems. And certainly from my experience in working in the clinic for the last eight months, as well as from the research that's coming out, we're beginning to see a prevalence of anxiety disorders, difficulties with mood and depression, sleep difficulties are very common, and for some, a post-traumatic stress reaction to their illness. Can I ask for the next slide, please? So this is very difficult, but what COVID has begun to kind of illustrate is an appreciation of the relationship between the mind and body. And that what happens to our bodies also happens to our minds and vice versa. And it's also given us an opportunity in adversity to come together with our colleagues across medical services from many different disciplines to provide a holistic and integrated service. Next slide, please. So what does that mean? So next slide, please. I feel like Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So what does that mean in practice? Well, that mean, means in practice that we have begun to kind of think about how we can address the psychological needs of people directly. And we've utilised a stepped care approach to do that. And we are incredibly fortunate to have some very good colleagues within the increasing access to psychological therapy service we've collaborated with around this. Uh, that means that being able to ensure that people with mild to moderate difficulties get access to the right service first time in a timely way. Um, and again, I can't be here with us today, but just to say, you know, to appreciate their input in this, this endeavour. Um, but we also offer specialist assessment within the clinic, particularly for people okay. with more complex difficulties um, and who need help in adjusting to long COVID. Um, and there are several um, modalities of therapy that we offer to kind of support this. Um, generally, these are modalities that we, we know have a good evidence base for long term physical health conditions and we've been able to adapt them successfully to, to kind of people experiencing long COVID. Examples include cognitive behaviour therapy, um, more relationship focused work for people that are struggling with the interpersonal impact of their illness, compassion-focused therapy, particularly for individuals like Kamala, who might be struggling with issues of kind of shame and self-criticism. But, you know, one of the great strengths of the Long COVID Clinic is the fact we've been able to come together and offer an integrated approach, and that's really taken form in the rehabilitation side of the clinic. And there we've been working with our colleagues to put together a joint rehabilitation programme, as well as developing kind of particular kind of specialisms from a psychology point of view that might be helpful. And that includes, for example, compassion focused approaches to working with depression, as well as support with people suffering from um, brain fog. Next slide, please. So individual work and working to deliver individual interventions and group interventions is only one part of what we do. In order to provide psychologically informed care every step of the way, We've also been working directly with our colleagues. So we work as part of a multidisciplinary team and that helps us to develop a shared understanding that integrates perspectives from a range of specialisms. We also offer consultation, supervision and training to our colleagues. 
And we try to we, we try to embed psychological effectiveness in every clinical encounter. And this can sometimes um, mean that we don't need to then sort of provide individual work for people if, if we can kind of provide across the board. And we also provide joint working with other services where that's helpful. Next slide, please. So again, just thinking sort of broadly of the role of a psychologist in the long COVID clinic, there are two other areas that we that we're interested in working into. One is supporting overall staff well-being and training. And this is so that we can ensure that we have a sustainable and resilient culture within the service. One of the things that we're launching in the near future are reflective practice groups to support this. And we're also keen as research practitioners to support the sharing of best practice and identifying research opportunities. And we come together on a regular basis with our psychology colleagues across the whole of the country in long COVID clinics to develop this. Next slide, please. So that's just a small visual summary of what I've talked about, just to help it kind of make sense in terms of the way in which we work at different levels within the clinic. I'll just move on to my last slide before I hand over to my colleague, Chloe. And I really just wanted to kind of sort of pull out here that although the symptoms are strange and frightening, although it's a fluctuating illness, that resiliency can be developed. Resiliency isn't innate, it's a toolkit that we develop, but one of the things which can support the development of it is to know that we are understood, that our experience is validated, and that we're treated with kindness by those around us. So each of us have a role to play in supporting people who are experiencing an illness like long COVID, and that includes both friends, neighbours, families, and also the professionals that they encounter in their pathway through the healthcare system. So this has been a bit of a whistle stop tour of psychology. I hope it's made sense. But I'm now going to hand on to my colleague, Chloe Spooner, who's going to talk in more detail about the rehabilitation side of the clinic. Chloe. Thank you, Kim. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so my name's Chloe Spooner, and I'm one of the lead senior occupational therapists based in the North Rehab Hub. Um, so as Kamala's kind of come through the assessment hub and started some work with psychology, and um, we're kind of picking up her next stage of recovery in the rehab hub. So I'm going to provide a bit of background about what we do in the rehab hub, but also talk through this next stage for Kamala. Um, so the rehab hub is made up of a number of different professionals who all work together um, to support recovery and to help Kamala reach the goals that she set um, in the assessment clinic, but then also individually with us. Um, and for a bit of background information, there's um, a hub in the north, which is based at Chesterfield Royal Hospital, um, and there's a hub in the south for rehab, um, which is at Florence Nightingale Hospital. Um, there are minor chain differences between the two, but all in all, we try and work in the same way, so it's an equitable service. Um, both hubs have um, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, um, rehab rehabilitation practitioners who work to support the OTs and physios, psychologists, which is something Kim's already gone through for us. Um, and those professionals also take on a dual role as case manager, um, so that there's someone who has an overview of um, each patient, each individual's care, um, so that if they need to move into another part of the service, they can do so with um, kind of a fluid approach. Um, and that way there's no long waiting lists and um, you kind of can dip in and out as you need and kind of switch between um, the professionals as as needed. And they are also the link back to the assessment clinic. So if there's any other um, medical concerns, we can kind of link in there. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so this is just a general pathway of what happens when you come into the hub. Um, so we, we get the referral for rehab from the assessment clinic and then a triage phone call is completed. Um, so I'll go into this in a bit more detail when I, I talk about Kamala's journey. Um, but the idea is that we get the most up to date information without having to duplicate that information. So we do our best to use the information you've used previously in the assessment clinic. Um, so that we're not asking the same questions lots and lots of times. 
Um, that information is then shared with the case manager who um, kind of has that overview of care as we've discussed and will kind of filter you into which part of the service that's needed um, and they will kind of also collect that information from those professionals and just have an overview of that care. Um, for Kamala, her case manager was OT and um, so it was built into the sessions that she was already having with OT um, for regular check-ins but other people might have a professional who um, isn't involved in their direct care and that would kind of um, look like having regular calls every couple of weeks to check in and make sure that everything's okay. Um, so can I have the next slide please? So now we're picking up Kamala's journey. Um, so can I have the next slide? And the first thing Kamala um, had was a triage call. Um, so like I said, this is just using the information we've already had from the clinic, see if there's any changes and um, if the symptoms have changed, what's still relevant. Um, we also kind of look in more de detail at the home setup, what sort of social support Kamala's got, what her daily routines are um, and what sort of activities she normally be completes on a day to day basis um, and if there's any of those that she's struggling with. We get a general overview of the work situation um, that's more up today um, and just see kind of like what what's expected of her um, and from there we identify what the biggest concern and overall aims are so that we know which part of the service is right for Kamala and um, so for her um, fatigue brain fog anxiety low mood um, and breathlessness was still remaining an issue um, she had returned to work as a phased return but was starting to struggle um, and there was a lot of pressure for her to kind of pick up more hours and return more fully um, which was causing a lot of stress so this was a real big concern for her. She was finding that outside of work she was only managing what she referred to as the bare essentials and very little else so she was managing to get herself washed and dressed um, some very quick and easy meals very light housework but other than that she didn't have the energy to do much else as a result her social life was suffering she wasn't getting the support from friends that she normally would she wasn't going out as much um, and she used to be involved in yoga and running and that's something that she wasn't able to do anymore she did try um, to do a yoga session but afterwards she had a long period where she was too fatigued to do anything else what I might refer to this as like a crash or a bust later on but basically means the energy spent and there's nothing left to do anything else with and um, she was having to take regular breaks when being active due to the breathlessness and fatigue and um, so she was managing to walk about 20 minutes before kind of becoming too out of breath and um, or tired to continue and she'd also kind of identified that as a result of the reduced activity she'd gained weight so she did want to kind of address that too. Um, so can I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so with work being such a big concern for Kamala, um, the first port of call was to kind of link her in with the occupational therapist. Um, and a lot of the focus we have in the rehab hubs is about what we call vocational rehab. So getting people back to work and helping them have the balance between work and home life. Um, so in Kamala's first appointment, we did an in-depth review of work. So understanding her role as a primary school teacher, what the setup was, what the demands were, and things like travel, the cognitive demands, the emotional demands of the job. And then we'd explore the symptoms and how this impacted on her ability to do the job and other activities in her day to day life. Um, we then did some initial baseline assessments to look at her physical um, well-being and some kind of like self-rated questionnaires just to understand where she was at that time and we set some goals. So Kamala's goals were about um, overall returning to work fully um, managing her fatigue better, getting a more even spread of activity so she wasn't kind of having um, these bust moments where she couldn't do anything an overall increase in that activity, strength and tolerance um, to activity. Um, so the first thing we did was write an educational letter 
to the workplace so that they understood um, her symptoms and the rehab process. So it took the pressure off from a phased return point of view. Um, and then from there, we started looking at her fatigue and how to manage that better. And um, once her fatigue kind of evened out and wasn't, she wasn't experiencing as many of those crashes I mentioned earlier, and um, we set up a rehab program based around what she needed to complete at work and, and incorporated that slowly building it up so that she could start to take on more duties. One of the things she'd mentioned was a concern in how she would run a PE class due to the environment. So we took a work, we did a workplace visit to look at that and provide any recommendations um, and basically stayed in touch with Kamala writing letters for, for work. So we understood where she was in her recovery and could make adjustments as needed. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So the other issue Kamala was experiencing was um, breathlessness. So we referred her to physiotherapy for respiratory input. Um, so they kind of look at breathing patterns in respiratory physio um, to understand why someone might be breathless. And for Kamala, she has something called a breathing pattern disorder. And um, when she'd been poorly with COVID, she'd adopted um, a new way of breathing to kind of accommodate for COVID and the body hadn't reset. So she was still breathing in a way that left her breathless and also took up a lot of energy. So the physio's focus was around um, assessing this, looking at how the symptoms presented, what made it feel better, what made it feel worse, um, and how they changed since she was initially poorly with COVID. And um, they looked at whether all the medical investigations had been completed to make sure there was no other causes and did the baseline assessments of watching her breathing pattern, looking at her oxygen levels and other observations, and then providing some education around breathing pattern disorders. And then her um, the treatment was about retraining brain, uh, her breathing. So they started off giving her some um, breathing retraining strategies to do when laid down and slowly worked up to her being more active and incorporating these. Um, until she was able to apply those techniques in exercise. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so after her fatigue was better managed and she was back at work and the um, breathlessness was kind of more under control, some of Kamala's goals was about returning to exercise. So being able to run again, being able to kind of participate in yoga. Um, so the other side of physio we have in the rehab hubs is reconditioning. So this is about returning to exercise, but increasing your activity and getting your body ready to kind of do those things. So to be able to participate in reconditioning physio, you need to be medically fit to exercise, not experiencing any kind of busts of energy. And um, so not having moments where you, you kind of can't engage in anything else due to your fatigue. Um, and also to kind of have some awareness of the breathing patterns and making sure that they're under control. And um, so once we checked those things with the case of Kamala, she had a six minute walk test, which is where a physio um, monitors how your body responds to walking for six minutes so that we know that you're ready for exercise. Um, and then she partaked in um, classes, which were 60 minutes every week involving a warm up, some cardiovascular exercises, strengthening exercises and a cool down. And throughout all of this, it was incorporated in the breathing techniques she learned and pacing um, for her energy. Um, so it was a real good way to kind of incorporate all of the things she'd learned into becoming more active. Can I have the next slide, please. Um, so we didn't have virtual groups set up for when Kamala came through our service. Um, but we are looking to get them set up very soon um, and they'll take the format of a kind of like gentle exercise, some education and some support from other people who experience COVID at the end and um, just peer support. So the topics that we're going to look at covering are understanding long COVID and um, fatigue management, sleep relaxation, breathlessness, mood, cognitive difficulties, activity management, planning for the future and vocational rehab. Um, so Kamala would have really benefited from these. So it's a shame we didn't have them set up, but they are coming soon and they're going to be a really important part of how we kind of deliver our service to, to individuals who come through. I'm going to have the last slide, please. 
So at this point, um, Kamala's back at work full time and managing her fatigue and um, starting to get back into exercise um, and is, is in a much better place than when she first came to us. So that doesn't mean her recovery journey is over, but more that the power and the control is handed back to her to continue her recovery um, outside of the rehab hub. So we referred her to um, social prescribing services. So they kind of link in with social groups that she could kind of go to and start building up her social life again. Um, and we also linked her in with a service called Live Life Better Derbyshire so that she could um, access their exercise by referral scheme. So there'd be someone providing her with an exercise programme who was well versed in um, the condition and able to give her the support and guidance she needed. Um, and they also provide a service that support weight management, which, um, like I mentioned, that was one of her concerns. So for Kamala, it's now kind of over to her to kind of continue that recovery and regain some of um, the life she had before. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Fawzia just to kind of wrap us up. Hi everyone. Uh, so that's a bit of a whistle stop tour through our service. Um, and really what we wanted to end with is where we where we see things going in the future. And you know, for those of you who may already be within the service or know a little bit about the service, um, since it started, we had a private Facebook group, uh, which has been a really helpful avenue for peer support uh, and for providing us with patients' lived experiences. And it's helped us so far um, change the way the service is run. Um, we recognise there was lots of conversations about um, people being isolated, people needing support with weight management, um, the impact of long COVID on people's livelihoods. Um, and sort of following on from that, we've been able to make links with multiple services across Derbyshire, um, services such as Live Life Better Derbyshire and also the Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, and going forward to sort of formalise that sort of patient input into our service planning, um, we have recently uh, uh, recruited or are in the process of recruiting into two uh, patient public participation posts so that they can attend our um, service operational delivery group uh, meetings and, and have some input into the way things look in the future. Um, in addition to that, we are also one of six uh, clinical sites in the UK participating in what will be um, one of the largest long COVID studies in the UK. It's called Stimulate ICP. Um, the research study aims to contribute to the working knowledge of, of what, how long COVID presents and um, how best to diagnose it and manage it. Uh, it will be comparing what we're doing at the moment to what, uh, what, how our service is impacted if we do scans such as an MRI scan um, or uh, start prescribing certain medications or prescribe um, sort of digital tools to aid in the um, process of the journey. Um, in addition to that, we're also working with uh, the University of Derby um, and, a, and a team led by Professor Mark uh, Fahi and Dr. Ruth uh, Ashton, who um, have been doing a, a number of studies across Derbyshire related to um, patient experiences since um, related to long COVID since um, 2020. Um, and I know that we've, one of their studies, PrEP19, um, will be helping us shape what um, what a patient's journey is looking like through this um, through this service. So they gather things like information on what sort of symptoms most people uh, experience prior to a boom or a bust, um, what sort of symptoms um, dictate potentially what would uh, indicate what a severe um, set of symptoms might look like. And sort of putting all those bits together, we hope that we can um, inform the patients in our service um, what sort of symptoms to look out for and, and how to manage their symptoms um, in terms of uh, how they can avoid their symptoms getting worse in, in sort of short episodes. Um, anyway, this is all sort of stuff to um, look forward to and, and watch this space. And, and thank you all for coming today and we'll be taking questions going forward. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting, really great. Um, so we've got one question in the chat uh, and then I'll ask people to pop their virtual hands up uh, if they've got any questions. Andrew's asked, 
Why do some people test positive COVID-19 and have no symptoms while others get long COVID-19 lasting over a year? Assuming both are young in good underlying health, is it a case of variation in genetic makeup or something else? I mean, there's, it's, it, uh, as I said, there's lots of studies taking place at the moment, and that's because ultimately we don't quite know yet. What we know is that there are lots of different processes at play. We know that there is an, uh, an immune um, system dysregulation part at play. We know that there may be some issues with the vascular system and clotting. Um, we know that there may be an element of viral persistence. So you, you get the infection and, and part of the virus doesn't um, sort of stays in your body for a bit longer than other people's. And we know all of these things may be at play. However, there's no concrete, um, I guess, cause that we've identified yet. And we're hoping that the research that goes on at the moment and that Derbyshire is really at, at the forefront of um, is, is stuff that will help us understand that a bit better. Um, so, so that's kind of what all I can say about it at this point, really. Um, what I would say is that within our service, we do, um, if there are treatable uh, symptoms related to your long COVID, then we are we are able to prescribe for those. It's just that there is so much that we don't know and, and we're relying on patients and, and sort of what we learn as we uh, develop and understand more through our service to, to shape the future of that. Thank you. And um, Michelle's asked, how long was Kamala involved with the PCS before returning to work? And have you linked up with the CFS uh, ME services in Derby? or Sheffield, as there appears to be a lot of common ground between the two conditions and illnesses. So um, she'd already started the phased return to work when she'd come under our service. Um, in terms of how long it took her to kind of get fully up and running, it was a slow process. Um, with fatigue, kind of the best thing to do is take it slow, slowly increase, pace the changes so that um, nothing kind of um, overwhelms or tips there's like a really delicate scale of doing too much um, and kind of a, having a bust so it had to be quite a slow process so it, it took quite a while a good couple of months to kind of get up there and um, in terms of linking in with chronic fatigue and ME services we do have links and um, so in they have got um, an OT specifically for kind of um, fatigue but with our service in the north, we do kind of like the base level stuff. And then if we feel like there needs to be a more issue, um, approach, we would refer on to um, chronic fatigue specialist services. So we do have links there. Um, and we've also had their support in setting up some of the resources we use to kind of educate on fatigue. Thank you. Um... Dawn has asked, is long COVID directly following the infection or can the symptoms occur sometime afterward? As Michelle said, the symptoms are very similar to other conditions, so good to know if they do link in. So in terms of long, long COVID directly following infection or can the symptoms occur sometime afterwards? I mean, um, typically most people have symptoms that aren't going away after four weeks and, and that's how you start thinking actually is the symptoms going to be lasting longer and um, we call it COVID-19 syndrome when it goes beyond 12 weeks um, and at that point um, your GP should have done some tests and investigations to make sure it's not other conditions um, however you know I completely agree there's overlap with lots of other symptoms and even when you're within our service we are often diagnosing other conditions as well and and suspecting other conditions may be at play and um, so this is why even while you're within our service we, we we maintain really good links with your GP so that we can um, ask and suggest them to do other tests that may point to other conditions um, and and so yeah, so so that's what I would say. It's it's a it's a condition that overlaps with many other conditions. Thank you. And um, John, whether you're there's any plans uh, to extend the service to Buxton and Glossop. Uh, so in terms of the Glossop side of things, I um, going forward, we, we are in discussion whether we um, Glossop retains what what services it has in place at the moment or whether we um, bring them in and actually offer what we're offering patients in Derbyshire um, so, so that's in, in discussion at the moment. 
Does anybody have any other questions? No. Right, one's just uh, popped in. Um, have GPs had any courses to inform them about long COVID? Um, yes, so the uh, GP task force and, and sort of the LNC are um, GP groups and bodies across the county that have training days related to various things. Um, I am providing them a session later this month, uh, actually next month, um, talking about long COVID. And actually, we do this fairly regularly just so that um, they're, they're clued up on the symptoms that they should be referring to us about. Um, one thing that we're quite happy with is, you know, we do get, uh, we often get questions from GPs you know, before they do referrals into us. They, they sort of um, ask about, you know, would this be an appropriate referral? And actually, we encourage this sort of open dialogue with our GPs across the county um, so that you, if you are in doubt whether it's somebody that should be referred in, then, you know, um, please get in touch and we'll be able to assist you. Um, and Nick said, as a healthcare musician, he's curious as to how broadly you are looking at potential SP type interventions. For example, singing is being shown to be beneficial for physical and psychological symptoms of long COVID alongside broad reaching mind, body and social benefits. I totally agree. Oh, Yeah, I was just going to say, we've, we've got some links with, um, I think it's called ENO, and um, the respiratory physios know a bit more about this than me, but um, it's looking at incorporating singing in kind of like a choir setting to kind of support the recovery, both mentally, but um, it help, also helps with breathing. So we do have access to that to kind of refer patients in too. I think that's one of, been, one of the interesting things about sort of long COVID is that we've seen quite a lot of um, innovation in terms of what helps. Of course, we need to kind of tie that back to an evidence base as well. And that's where the kind of research comes in. A lot of the work we're doing is about how you adapt existing interventions to the particular needs of kind of the long COVID population, but also how we individualise interventions to kind of meet that need, given the kind of array of symptoms that people can, can experience. Thank you. Leslie, you've had your hand up for a while, your virtual hand. Thank you. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. I really appreciated that. Um, the work that you're doing is is so valuable and so useful. And I was really pleased to hear about the mind and body connection that you are making loud and clear there, because it is a problem that we suffer in everyday stuff, really, with, with our work. Um, I just wanted to know, are you making any plans to connect with the voluntary sector in terms of particularly the rehabilitation? I mean, you were talking about the choirs and things there. They obviously have a lot of connections already. And there's a lot going on that actually, if you're talking about evidence base, the voluntary sector is desperate for people to see the evidence base. They've got it and they want you to use it. And we need for people to understand the value of the voluntary sector. So this is a wonderful opportunity to try and pull the two together. Um, completely agree um, with that, actually, and and we are doing lots of work within our communities to um, to to make the aware increase the awareness about long COVID, and actually what sort of support because it works both ways as well. Because on the one hand, we we can learn a lot from um, the people who are who are, who are approaching uh, local community leaders and and talking about their symptoms and and their struggles. And, and we can pick up that information and we can t tell them about the service that exists and when to go to their GP um, and take it from there that way. And on the other hand, um, we sort of, in terms of the voluntary sector, th there's lots of different things at play. We know that um, Alison will probably be able to help you with this, um, but we, we have, uh, I forget her name, but we, ha we have a few people that we're, we're dealing with in terms of community champions. Um, that would be able to, to sort of reach out into these voluntary groups. Yeah, did you want me to come in on that, Fauzi? Yeah, um, please. Just, um, it's, it's specifically regarding um, some work that is gonna happen with regarding to health inequalities. So obviously this is happening across the NHS in lots of different services, but it's no different for the post COVID service. So we are currently um, recruiting to some specific roles within Derbyshire who will be able to start looking at some of the um, patient flow that we get and people who may not be accessing the service and why that may be, whether they're, you know, they're not able to access a GP or you know, people have raised 
you know, that perhaps GPs aren't um, allowing referrals through. So we're really, really keen to start some of that work um, and that will be linking very closely with the um, uh, COVID community champions that have been in place throughout COVID, whose work initially was to do with the vaccination uptake. Um, the work they've done has been hugely successful and they've made some really, really good links with um, harder to reach communities. So um, gypsies and travellers, um, lots of different communities within Derby City Centre. Um, so we're really hopeful that um, when we've got some sort of specific resource in place that we can really start focusing in on on people who we feel may be suffering and going through all of these things um, and not accessing help that's available to them. So that's hopefully all going to be starting in the next couple of months and we'll, we'll really see some progress from that. Anybody else at all? Well, thank you very much to um, everybody who's, who's spoken today and contributed the Derbyshire Dialogue. It was really, it was really interesting uh, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of great feedback on that one. Uh, we will be uploading this to YouTube as well, so I'll circulate the link so you can share out to anybody that you think might find this session useful, um, along with uh, contact details for you to get in touch with the service if you wish to. Um, if there's no more questions, the uh, only thing to uh, tell you is that our next session is going to be around orthopaedic care in Derbyshire. Uh, and some exciting new de um, developments in that. Further details will be sent out next week. Uh, and to remind you that we are um, launching the peer leadership training on the 8th of September, and I'll include that in the email as well. Uh, Leslie will give it a big thumbs up, won't you, Leslie? <laughs> Leslie's already already done it, so she's going to be our, our, uh, our um, advocate for, for that particular training, but it is welcome uh, for people across Derby and Derbyshire, we really do want people who are using the services to be involved in influencing the services. So more details about that will be sent next week. But thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, we're getting a lot of good comments. A lot of thanks, a lot of good comments in the chat. So um, we will see you all very soon. Uh, it stopped raining, so um, I can escape from my office. Uh, have a lovely afternoon and we'll see you very soon. <laughs>